Okay, so welcome. Thanks again for the introduction. Uh, so the equation we have on the curtain is this one. And my talk will be about the equation and I will even actually prove it or derive it. So that will be the last part and that will be perhaps the part that we don't have time for or I will need more time until than until 4 p.m. since we started late. But I will also talk about Shannon, who is the guy behind this formula. And so what does it mean? Um, this formula means that in, basically what it means is that in wireless communications, if you have a signal to noise ratio of a certain magnitude, let's say this guy is uh, 12, then you can communicate at most log one plus that number, your SNR, bits per second per hertz. So this is uh, without unit here, but uh, it, so this C you have here is the number of bits per second per hertz that you can communicate uh, more or less uh, noises, noiselessly in the sense that your bits will get through to the receiver. So if you didn't see this before, what I just said uh, probably didn't uh, reach you all, or you probably didn't understand all of it. I will actually try to explain exactly what the formula means. And through that, I will need equations <clears throat> and we will get there. But before we get there, we will talk about the guy behind this formula, if I'm able to, yeah. <clears throat> so probably most of you here have heard about Claude Shannon, even if you don't know about all his work. Uh, so he is, um, let's see, now I can't see my own slide, which is a bit annoying. How do I? Uh, okay. Shannon, you have him here. In the picture here, he is playing with his mechanic mouse in the maze uh, that he built for it. We will get there. <clears throat> uh, <coughs> sorry. <clears throat> so Shannon has been called uh, the, the greatest scientist of the 20th century that no one has heard of. And as I said, I think most of you have heard of him. But if you ask the man in the street, probably that person has not heard of Shannon, while probably most people have heard about Einstein, for example. Uh, to some extent, you could argue that Shannon has been more important for our daily lives than Einstein has been, because uh, Shannon's theory is behind a lot of, or basically all of the <clears throat> digital technology that we use these days, and in particular when it comes to communication, digital communication. <clears throat> so Shannon, uh, to give some background, he graduated in 1936 from University of Michigan with the bachelor. <clears throat> he joined uh, MIT in 1937. <clears throat> Sorry. <clears throat> and at the MIT, he completed the master thesis, and his master thesis has been called the most influential master thesis of all times. Because uh, <clears throat> what he did in his master thesis at MIT was to explain how Boolean algebra can be used to analyze and synthesize. Well, at that time it was electromechanical switches. Nowadays we use this for digital, purely digital circuitry to analyze digital circuitry, you know, AND and NAND and XOR gates and so on. And all of us who have a background in computer science or electrical engineering, we have, we have studied this, how you use Boolean algebra for, <coughs> for combining bits into digital circuitry. So the guy behind this is Shannon and he did this already in his master thesis. <clears throat> uh, 
And then he wrote the PhD thesis uh, at MIT also. His PhD thesis is not as well, not at all as well known and probably not as influential as, or no, definitely not as influential as his master's thesis. So the PhD thesis was about uh, genetics or mathematics for genetics. So after finishing the PhD, he joined Princeton and the Institute for Advanced Study, where you had people like uh, Gödel and Einstein and von Neumann, all the heroes of the day. So he could interact with them. So after spending a year, a little more than a year there, he joined Bell Labs. Uh, and at Bell Labs, since the war was ongoing, they had a lot of what they did was for the government uh, work on problems motivated by the war. Some things to mention from Shannon's time at Bell Labs, for example, he, he invented what we now call signal flow graphs. And many of, his, many of us have seen these two and worked with them. Uh, he invented them in 1942. He also worked on prediction and smoothing in fire control systems together with people that you probably also heard about like Blackman or I'm sure you heard about Board. And at the same time roughly you have had also Norbert Wiener for example working on these problems. So filtering and prediction uh, for fire control motivated by fire, fire control. But of course this was a also basic research that is very important for the future to come. And a very important work he finished and it was classified when it was published. It was called the Mathematical Theory of Cryptography. Uh, published 1945 but classified, so it was not available to, to the public then. And after <clears throat> After working at Bell Labs, he joined MIT to be on the faculty in 1956, and he retired in 1978. So now I will go through a few of Shannon's most important papers. Um, the paper that lies behind what I'm talking about today is this one. Claude Shannon a Mathematical Theory of Communication. It was published in two parts in 1948. So this research was, he, he started this research at Bell Labs, but couldn't publish it there. Uh, it was partly classified. And then he continued after the war and was able to publish 1948. So this, since my talk is about formulas, I, I just list a few equations from his paper. And as you already know, I will talk about more, more about the log one plus SNR formula. <clears throat> so I will get back to that. But in this paper, he also has this green one that I will also talk a little bit about soon, where he um, uh, quantified how much you can compress a message of length L bits, say bit, length L bits, how much you can compress it without information loss. And you can compress it down to the number given by the entropy of the source. Uh, most of you probably heard about entropy and I will get back to that. So this is a lower bound. He also proved that you can achieve this bound by encoding longer and longer sequences of bits. So this, this equation here means that. You also have this equation here, C equal max of I X to Y, which is a general formula for channel capacity. I will, won't talk much about this one. I will focus about the concept of channel capacity and the log one plus SNR formula. In this paper, he also has for the first time the sampling theorem as we know it. Uh, all of us who have studied signal processing, digital signal processing or control or communications, we know about the sampling theorem. The sampling theorem is usually accredited to Shannon and also uh, um, Harry Nyquist. 
who had who had the version of it in his work earlier in the 30s, I think. But in the version we know it when the way we teach it now is due to Shannon, and it was actually in this paper. Uh, so this paper was 1948. Then in 49, he followed up with more work on the theoretical limitations and foundation, the theoretical foundations for digital communications. In this paper, he focused more on, on wireless communications, uh, you could say, while the first paper was in part more abstract. <clears throat> And in this paper, you have very important results like, like this formula here. You see P equal and an integral. And that's also illustrated in the right figure. Uh, and that is the best way to allocate. Um, it illustrates the best way to allocate power to and transmit when transmitting a signal in, in a noise that has a variation in frequency. So this is used in our mobile phones um, or basically in all wireless communications because the channels that that they these devices experience they typically have this kind of noise background at least when you consider also that the channels uh that the radio signals go through, they affect the spectrum of the received signal. So you get to a model that is equivalent to this one. We don't need to go into more detail here, but also in this paper, there were very important results that are that are used in today's systems. The right figure here explains how you can map a one-dimensional signal to a two-dimensional space. Uh, I won't go into detail here either, but that also has very important uh, uh, implications for how we think about transmitting signals in noise. Uh, and then, so as I said already, when working during the war on cryptography, he finished an internal report published in 1945 a version of that was published publicly available in 1949. And the paper published then was is called Communication Theory of Secrecy Systems. And here he introduced a cipher system. And he also introduced what we now call the one-time pad. And he proved for the first time that basically the one-time pad is necessary and sufficient in the sense that if you're going to send a message and encrypt it and be 100% sure that it cannot be the crypt encrypted uh, message cannot be broken, then you have to have a key that is at least as long as your message. And basically what you do is that you, you multiply or you, you add to your message a completely random key to scramble it completely. And then only a person who has the key can reproduce the mess original message. So he proved that the, mess that the key has to be as long as the message. And it's also sufficient to have a key that is as long as the message, but it's not possible to have a key that's shorter than your message. Uh, mess, yeah. <clears throat> And Shannon was a fun guy in the sense that he also worked on things that don't have really any engineering application, but uh, are still important. For example, he is one of the first people to write the computer program for playing chess. And he published this in 1948, as you can see. Then in the 50s, uh, I mean, I'm not, listing all Shannon's papers, I list the ones that have been had the most influence or or are important for other reasons. In the 50s, for example, he worked on, as you can see, the title is Prediction and Entropy of Printed English. And this is an illustration. So basically, he analyzed using his own tools for information, con 
class to quantify information content, uh, he used it and applied it to written English, illustrated here. <clears throat> and then in the late 50s, he published his final big theory, which is very well known to us who work in information theory, not so well known outside information theory. And this is called rate distortion theory of 1948 the rate distortion theory talks about how much can you compress the signal subject to a certain fidelity which has for example when we compress an image it's in general not possible to compress it and keep exactly the same information in the sense of the raw information contained in the original image but we can produce something that looks very much like the original image and this is a theory for quantifying how much um, compression is possible subject to having a fidelity, fidelity criterion. Also very important and has lots of practical implications, but perhaps not as well known. The theory part of it is probably not as well known. So as I said, Shannon was a fun guy. He, he, uh, He's very much both uh, was very much both an inventor and a mathematician. Perhaps he was more an inventor than a mathematician. So his papers actually usually don't have proper proofs uh, in the sense what a mathematician would call a full proof or a full proof proof. <laughs> Um, his proofs are more like arguments that something should be correct or true. And then after Shannon, more mathematically inclined people have proved that everything he claimed was true, also in the pure mathematical sense. But Shannon himself didn't always publish proofs. And he was very much an inventor and he invented... Uh, first of all, I should say that his hobbies included juggling and unicycling. So therefore most information theorists, they know that you have to be good at juggling and unicycling, otherwise you're not a proper information theorist. And I can say I can juggle only three balls, which is not very much. And I can do a little bit unicycling. Um, so perhaps I'm qualified. Um, uh, Shannon did both. He also built, built several juggling machines or robots or a primitive robots you could call them for juggling. Uh, he, he built his robotic mouse maze called Theseus. And this, this is another illustration of the robot, robotic mouse, <laughs> the maze for the robotic mouse. Um, he built a flamethrowing trumpet. Don't ask me how that worked. Uh, computer chess, I mentioned already. He built several computers and computing devices. Actually, he also built a wearable computing device that he used, we'll call it, uh, to uh, try to... Um, yeah, he used it in Las Vegas uh, to summarize. At the time when no one expected someone to come there with a variable computer. And he built in the early 80s, he built the Rubik's Cube solver. It's actually illustrated here to the left, Shannon's Rubik's Cube solver. <clears throat> so please interrupt if there are any questions so far. So otherwise, okay, I will now go to more of the equations. So when you talk about Shannon and equations and information theory, I, there are two equations you have to show, I think. The first one is uh, <clears throat> um, this one, the blue, the upper blue one, which is Shannon's definition of entropy. And the lower one is Shannon's definition of mutual information. So let me first explain entropy. So if you have a discrete intervalued random variable with a distribution P of X that, that um, 
lists the various probabilities for, for different outcomes. Then the, the entropy, or sometimes we say Shannon entropy to distinguish from entropy in, in thermodynamics or in quantum physics. Uh, it, the Shannon entropy of that random variable is, as you see in this formula, it's, it's minus the average of log of the probabilities. And log here can be log to any base. Usually you assume this is binary log log base two, and then the, the unit for entropy would be bits. Actually, the, the, I should say that bits, it's actually a term that Shannon came up with. It's in his paper, binary unit or digit, no, binary unit. So that says, I think, perhaps something about his influence, a word that we all use daily, bit or bits, is a word that he came up with. Uh, you can also have log and other log, like the natural log, and then the, the unit for entropy would be nuts for natural, uh, nat, nat, natural units. So entropy is uh, non-negative, and it's zero only when all the outcomes are equally likely. No, sorry, <laughs> that's wrong. Only when one outcome has all the probability then entropy is equal to zero. Entropy is not bigger than log of the number of possible outcomes. And you have equality on, this is when you have equality when out, all outcomes are equally likely. And the established interpretation, intuitive interpretation for what, what entropy measures is, you could say it, it measures uncertainty removed when you observe the value of x. So the more uncertain we are about the value of x before we observe it, before we observe an outcome, the more information we will gain when we observe. So you, I think it's easy to argue that we are maximally uncertain about the value if all outcomes are equally likely then there is, so to speak, no statistical structure at all. All outcomes are equally surprising. And that will also be when we get, gain the most information when we make an observation. So then it, that's also when entropy is maximized. And on the other hand, if one outcome has all the probability, then we are not uncertain at all about the outcome that will be observed because only one outcome is possible and then entropy is zero. And then we have also the related entity mutual information uh, for two random variables that have a joint distribution. And it's defined like this. As you can see, it's um, you have the joint, it's an average over the joint distribution of log of the ratio between the joint distribution and the product of the marginal distributions. And through another concept called cobrach leibler divergence or um, relative entropy, you can interpret mutual information as a distance between the distance between the correct joint distribution and the dis joint distribution you would have if the two variables were independent. So in this sense, uh, mutual information measures uh, how correlated or two random variables are in the sense of non-linear correlation. Um, so the more dependent they are, the more different they are from being independent, the more information they contain about each other. So therefore you say that mutual information measures how much information you get about one variable when you observe another one, the other one, and it's symmetric also. <clears throat> Let's see if I have time. Yes, probably. So let me illustrate also a more operational meaning for entropy. Most of you have probably seen something like this. So as I said, the, 
the intuitive meaning of entropy is the uncertainty removed when you observe a random variable or information gained. A slightly more operational meaning relates to, as I said before, how much you can compress information. So if I illustrate here a random variable with four outcomes, and they are listed here in decreasing order of probability. So you have the probabilities here, 0 0.4, 0 0.35, 0 0.2, 0 0.05. Uh, if you want to observe and store or transmit uh, a value of this, an observation of this random variable, a raw description would require two bits as you can see two bits can enumerate four outcomes. So I could enumerate the four outcomes 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. That's straightforward. But if I take, it, take into account the frequency of the occurrence of the different outcomes, namely that it's much less frequent, you will observe the outcome four much less frequently than you observe outcome one. Then I can reduce the average number of bits spent per observation by instead in a coding the four outcomes into bits as illustrated here i call the first the most likely outcome i call zero <clears throat> the second most likely outcome i call one zero and then the two less likely outcomes I call 110 and 111. So here I actually give three bits to two of the outcomes, but they are not so likely to occur. So that doesn't cost too much because I gain more from giving one bit only to the most likely outcome. And this here will give me 1.85 bits per uh, sample instead. And then the entropy quantifies how much is it possible to compress without loss. And it's actually possible to get down to 1.74 bits in this case. But in general, that's only possible by grouping together a large number of uh, samples and coding them jointly. So that will in general be more complex. Uh, but this is something that Shannon had in his paper and he, uh, he had both the, the lower bound and proved that it's possible to reach the lower bound. Okay, then I'm back at the formula that I'm supposed to speak about. And please let me know if you have questions so far because now I will only talk about this formula for the remainder. Uh, Mikael, the there is a question. Yes. Uh, yeah. Eris asks, should the code be also prefix free? Yeah, it's a, it's a good observation. Uh, actually, prefix free is without loss in the sense that if you have a uniquely decodable code, so one that you can, so if you just see a sequence of zeros and ones, uh, you have to be able to to um, purge, no, not purge, to, to group it into um, symbols that mean code words that, that correspond to uh, co source symbols. Because you don't have any extra symbols like commas or uh, semicolons or so that you can put be between. So codes where you have a long sequence of bits that can be uniquely grouped into code words and thus be decoded, they are called uniquely decodable. And the question relates to prefix free codes and they are a group of uniquely decodable codes. And actually it doesn't cost you anything to have prefix free. Uniquely decodable is the assumption you need. So I didn't say that, but an assumption here behind this result is that the compressed bits are uniquely decodable. And a prefix free code exists at the same with having the same compression rate. Okay, so back to the formula log one plus S and R. 
So as I said, what it means is how many bits can you send per second per hertz in over a wireless channel at SNR, at this SNR. I will actually do my best to be much more specific so that you can see exactly what this means. And some of you who have never seen this before, I understand it will be a, a, a mouthful, but I will do my best. And I will even show how to derive this formula. Uh, so to get started, I have to introduce this uh, system here. So what we have, we have a message W. And we want to communicate W. W is an integer between 1 and M, and it's uniformly drawn. So it's some raw information that we want to communicate from here to over here. So raw message W of resolution M, we want to communicate it from here to over here. And we, the communication happens in noise, and the noise sits here. And we have a transmitter or encoder that takes the message W and maps it into a sequence of symbols that can be transmitted on the channel. This is called a channel. So X uh, superscript N means a sequence of N different length N sequence of uh, signals or symbols that can be transmitted. Of course, this is all abstract here. There are no, there is no electronics or anything in this figure. And then the sequence of length n is transmitted, and it's disturbed by noise of the same length. And and the received signal is y of the same length, and the received signal is fed to a decoder, and the decoder takes this sequence, the received sequence or signal and maps that into a guess of what W was. So to do this, we need a list of possible sequences to transmit, and they are called the code words. So inside the, the encoder, you have a list of sequences, one for each possible value of W, and then when you see a certain W, you can transmit the corresponding code word. And this list is called the code book. Each code word satisfies a power constraint. Otherwise, we could just use infinite power and the noise wouldn't matter. So there is a power constraint. We don't need to, to uh, go into the details of the power constraint, but, but each code word satisfies a second order power constraint. So as I said, the encoder maps the message into a transmitted code word and it scales the code word because the power constraint I put that to one here so I do a power scaling here and I just call the power SNR because uh, the received signal is Y and it's disturbed by a sequence Z corresponding of uh, independent equally distributed uh, Gaussian samples so the noise is Gaussian and independent. And end of unit variance per uh, sample. So since the noise is unit variance, uh, you have the, the signal power is SNR equal to SNR, and it's also equal to the signal to noise ratio because the noise has variance one. So all the SNR goes here. And then the decoder produces a guess of the transmitted W as I said. So what's the problem here? Uh, the problem is that we would like to send a lot of information using as short code words as possible. So you, sh you, you would want n, small n to be small because in a practical system, a longer code word will cost you more bandwidth usually. It either costs you more bandwidth or more power, but we can say bandwidth. Uh, so larger, if if the code words get longer, then the, it will cost you more bandwidth 
to transmit the code word. And we want bigger M, we want to be able to communicate higher resolution information. So there is a trade off between M and N that we will get to, but let's first introduce something else that we call rate. So let's couple the length of a code word, length N, to the number of code words, big M, by saying, Big M is equal to E raised to N times R, where R is some non-negative number, and rounded up to, so this notation here means round up to the closest integer. So I couple N and M through this number R, which I call the rate of the code. So for bigger rate, uh, the number of code words grows faster with the length of the code words. So you want the rate to be big because, as I said, you want many possible code words or higher information resolution for, for a fixed code word length or per uh, transmitted um, code word component, you could say. So you want the rate to be high. And then let's define, let's say that I have a sequence of code box or codes of increasing size. So they are indexed by the length of the code words N, but you have the size here through the rate M. Let's say that I have a, a sequence of code words, they get longer and longer and bigger and bigger. And let P sub E and subscript N denote the probability of decoding error, namely that the symbol that the decoder produces is not equal to the transmitted symbol indexed by N. Then there is a number, and this is proved in Shannon's paper. The number is called channel capacity, introduced by Shannon, such that for each rate that is smaller than this number C, there is a sequence of bigger and bigger and longer and longer codes, such that the average probability of error will go to zero with the increasing length of the code words. And for rates bigger than C, there are no such sequences, there are no such codes. So C is a very strict um, threshold below which you can you can send by sending longer and longer code words you can send information without with vanishing error probability while above that number you cannot send without error actually you can even prove that the error probability goes goes to one for any rate about c so we'll you will certainly make an error and then Back to the formula then, for this model, the one I described, the capacity is one half, and I use a natural logarithm now because I have base E up here, doesn't matter, one plus SNR. So exactly the SNR that I have in the equation here, that number. For this model, the capacity is one half, and the fact of one half comes from the fact that the model is real valued. Uh, this general formula that doesn't have the one half factor in front of it is for a complex valued model. That's why you don't have the factor one half. So for this real valued model, this is the capacity. And that's, that's Shannon's theorem, you could say. He proved that there is something that is called channel capacity. He proved that capacity um, quantifies information transmission like I described. And he, approved, he proved that for the model I described, there is a formula for capacity and it's a rather simple formula. So actually this is a, an illustration from Shannon's 48 paper with some modifications. For example, the red stuff was not in his uh, 
and are also renamed. But basically, this illustration was in his paper. So Shannon proved that if you have on the y-axis uncertainty about the transmitted message at the receiver, how much uncertainty? How uncertain is the receiver about the transmitted value uh, symbol? And on the x-axis, you have the rate. Then Shannon proved that for all rates below C, you can be arbitrarily, arbitrarily certain about the transmitted message. So the uncertainty can be arbitrarily small or low. While above C, it's impossible to be completely certain about the transmitted message. And why is this a breakthrough? Uh, it's a breakthrough because Shannon proved that, that this number C is positive. It's some positive number here. Uh, so you can have a positive rate, you can have a possible information throughput, at arbitrarily low error rate or arbitrarily high certainty in any noise. Of course, the level of the noise will influence your C, but C will stay positive. So noise is not really the limiting factor uh, as long as you are willing to sacrifice rate. So before Shannon, people thought that Yes, it's possible to get to very low uncertainty, but it costs rate. And of course, if the rate is zero, there is only one code word. So you can transmit only one message. And there is no uncertainty at all about which message was transmitted because you know it. There was so, there is only one. And that is rate zero. And to get to zero uncertainty, you would have to sacrifice rate down to rate zero. That, that is what was the common belief before Shannon. And you can get, you can decrease uncertainty by repeating your message, for example, and that to get to um, uh, still some uncertainty, but lower uncertainty. But you cannot go down to zero uncertainty without going down having the rate go down to zero was the general belief before Shannon. So this is why this is a so big breakthrough. But Shannon proved no, uh, you can have positive information throughput. And of course, this is crucial for all digital communications and storage and everything that we have today. So what I what I have now, even if time is running out, uh, we started late though, is that I will actually show you how to, uh, as I said, Shannon proved that uh, capacity can be computed like this log one plus an R. And I will show you how to prove that uh, because the proof, one of Shannon's big contributions, what was a trick for proving this. And for those of you who need to leave now uh, and don't, or for some other reason, wish not to look at the proof, I can show you the trick, namely the trick, uh, I have it over here, is called Shannon's random coding argument. Basically, Shannon made it possible to analyze this uh, system by allow, allowing random code generation. Uh, exactly what this means, I, I think you will have to stay and look at, at the proof to understand exactly what this means. Uh, but that is a big scientific or academic contribution because this trick is then something that is used over and over again in, in information theory. And I think also in analyzing graphs, for example. Instead of analyzing a certain uh, certain graph or a certain code, you analyze the average over an ensemble of graphs or code. Okay, for those of you who wish to stay, ask. Perhaps I should ask Arvind if if I can continue or.
we have to stop. What I have uh, list left is a proof of the. How much time do you think it will take? I can do this in 10 minutes, but then certainly. I would suggest the following. I yeah. suggest the following that those who are going to leave, if you have questions, please ask Mikhail now because he's available and we can discuss the questions now. And if then there are still people around, we will. I would like to listen to the proof so we can stay a bit longer. So are there questions? I have one. Um, yeah. So this proof or the, the limit, you uh, derive it for white noise, I assume. So does it depend on the spectrum of the noise also or? Uh, yes, it does, but this one is for white, but this actually in this paper from 49, here he showed how to handle noise that is not white. So the mm -hmm. equations here, I mean, here actually the, these, these are, parametric characterization for capacity as a function of power in any noise color. Uh, hmm. those, those are the equations that I show here. And those are from 1949. Okay. But in the 48 paper, the noise was uh, white. Okay, let's, so okay, I'm yeah, let's this, continue. So this is a talk about equations hmm. or one hmm. equation. So I, I and then you have to have a proof. That's what yeah. I'm thinking. But <laughs> yeah, let's continue. I think people will stay around for. for yeah. So time. let's see how this how this goes. So how to prove that this formula is a formula for capacity? So the proof, most proofs in information theory, they go like this. First, you prove what what can be done, and that's called achievability. What can be achieved? That corresponds to proving that. C capacity is bigger than or equal to this number. And then you prove that what cannot be achieved, that's called the converse. And that is in this case to prove that C is smaller than or equal to this number. And then you get an equality because you have bigger than or equal to and smaller than or equal to. So it has to be equal to. So first achievability then. So you have the fixed rate. Remember what rate is. Rate characterizes the relation between the length of the code words and the number of code words. And we want the rate to be high because that means more code words per code word length. For fixed rate, fix M and N of course is fixed also. Then draw, uh, N independent equally distributed Gaussian samples, zero one Gaussian, put them in the first code word and repeat this for all the other code words. So do this M times. So you, you draw independent equally distributed ran, uh, normal or Gaussian zero one variables and put them in the code book. Right now it's strange, why do I draw random code uh, symbols? Well, this is ran Shannon's random coding argument and I will get to uh, that it, it works out, <laughs> it makes sense to do this. But right now we just accept that we do this. So let this, these uh, sequences form the code book. We note that these, the sequences will fulfill the power constraint asymptotically. I don't worry more about the power constraint than this right now. Uh, you should have an ep you should have the epsilon and deltas in here to have the power constraint taken care of. But note that since they are they are drawn Gaussian zero one, they will all fulfill the power constraint asymptotically for big n. Then for for a certain information symbol transmit the corresponding code word and the receiver receives the code word scaled and in noise. This looks a bit messy I understand but what we have are two, the two PDFs for the received sequence 
conditioned on a specific transmitted sequence, the Gaussian with that average, or the received sequence average over the randomly generated transmitted sequences. Uh, fix an epsilon. Let S be this number that we will actually will turn out to be the capacity. And then this looks messy, but what I have here, I have the set here is for any fixed X sequence. This set basically describes the log likelihood ratio test between the hypothesis that the receipt sequence is described by the conditional distribution or the average distribution. And the set contains the X, Y pairs where it's more likely that the Y sequence is described by the conditional distribution for a specific X. Don't worry if you didn't get this precisely, but this is how the decoder works now. So when you receive Y, the decoder decides that I is the transmitted symbol if the corresponding code word, I's code word, is the only one that is more likely than the average code word. The only code word in this set together with the, yeah, the only code word in this set. Probability of error, define pi of n as the probability of error also over the randomness of the code book generation. So the randomness here is over the symbol, the code book and the noise. Uh, a small thing here is that since we gen there is total symmetry in the generation of the code, so we can condition on the first code word being transmitted. We will have the same average probability of error. So define these sets. Uh, this is the set of all for fixed W code word. It's the set of all Y that are decoded into that code word by the decoder. Okay, then there will be an error in the transmission if the, we transmit the first code word. So if the co first code word is not detected by this the decoder we have here, then there will be an error or one of the other code words are, is declared to be the correct code word, one or more. Only then we will have an error. Uh, and this we can bound by the union bound. And remember that everything here is conditioned that we transmitted the first code word. So the first term is the probability that the first code word will not be detected by the decoder. Uh, there are equations here and it's quite straightforward to prove that that probability goes to zero as n grows. We don't need to look at all the details. So it's straightforward to see that the first probability goes to zero. And then you have the other probabilities. Sorry, go, I go back and forth. The other probabilities were the probabilities that another code word will be declared by the decoder and the sum over those. Here, the, the key is to note that the, for the other, when we, the other code words, then the first one will be independent from the received sequence because we have condition that we sent the first code word. And without doing all the details, because you have independence, we can say product here when we compute this probability. And then you can bound simply from the definition of the set here. You have an inequality here that we use. We, we can skip the details. I use that inequality to bound uh, here twice ending up over here to say that each of those in individual probabilities is not bigger than e raised to minus n times s. Remember s is the number that we want to prove is the capacity minus epsilon. And then we have a sum over m minus one of these. So you multiply by m minus one and that m we can move to the exponent through r. Remember that r tells you m in terms of n. So we can move R to the exponent. 
So here we see directly that you can make the error probability go to zero as long as the rate here is not bigger than S minus two epsilon, say. So now Shannon's coding argument. For, for any rate smaller than S minus two epsilon, we have the average error probability go to zero. And remember the average was an average also over the random code book generation. I stress that here. But if the average of the random code book generation goes to zero, then there must be at least one sequence of codes, actual codes, existing deterministic codes, that also gives an error probability that goes to zero. Otherwise the average cannot go to zero because it's bounded from below by zero. So if the average goes to zero, then at least one possible sequence must exist. So this is random, Shannon's random coding argument. By analyzing the average code, you can say something about the existence of a good code. So we actually proved that since the error probability goes to zero for any rate uh, not bigger than one half SNR, log one plus SNR minus two epsilon, Capacity cannot be smaller than that number. So now we have a lower bound. And then I will just skip through the other one. I, we don't have time for the details, but to prove uh, equality, next step is to prove that the capacity cannot be bigger than this number. We just prove that it's not smaller than that number. And here a key, Shannon didn't use this. This is due to Fano. It came in the six in the fifties. Uh, but the key, the key you use these days to prove this is called Fano's inequality. And by using this, you can die, you can get an inequality for your rate in terms of mutual information terms, the sum over. And the important part here is an epsilon of n. And this epsilon of n goes to zero if the probability of error goes to zero at the finite rate. So if for a specific code sequence, if it can achieve a low error probability at the specific rate, then this epsilon here goes to zero. And we skip the details. And then you go through additional inequalities in involving also taking the power constraint into account because we know if a code, uh, any allowable code fulfills the power constraint. So you have a sequence of inequalities that prove that gives you that the rate, if the code, oh, sorry, I'll stress this again. If you have a sequence of codes growing in length and size, that can achieve arbitrarily low error probability at rate R, then rate R over here, must be smaller than or equal to one half log log one plus SNR plus an epsilon n that goes to zero. Yeah, that's a proof, even if I didn't do all the details of this guy, that capacity is not smaller than log one plus SNR. And as I said, actually this is a more or less full proof. It only takes a few pages, uh, some more details. But Shannon didn't have the proof. He had uh, illustrations and convincing argumentation, but no detailed proof. So the first proper proof uh, came in 53, I believe. I think it's due to Feinstein, the Russian, no, actually Russian moved to the in America. No, Russian mathematician, um, I think. Yeah, I am there. I even showed you the proof, uh, and that Great. is not this. This is not hard. It's easy. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you. Again.